All right. Sorry, everyone. Perhaps um, the internet connection is not very good today. So I will start again uh, introducing our speaker, Dr. Sheda Fiza Jilani. Uh, Dr. Sheda Fiza Jilani is currently working as a lecturer in, le in the Radio Spectrum Engineering Department of Physics at Reef in University UK since July 2020. Before that, she worked as a research scientist at the University of Maine, USA on the U.S. Department of Energy project on the technology transitions of harsh environments RF sensors to the industry. She did PhD in antennas and electromagnetic from the Queen Mary University of London in 2018. Her research interests are in the fields of electromagnetics, multiband, wideband, and reconfigurable antennas designed, antennas array, Flexible antennas for the next generation's travel electronics, minimum wave antennas for 5G applications, high frequency mass surface, acoustic wave sensor, and transducer, and co authored one book, five book chapters, and more than 40 technical conference. So, without ado, Please welcome Dr. Fiza Jilani. Thank you so much, guys. <clears throat> Sorry about uh, this interruption. And I'm sharing my screen. I hope you guys uh, could see that. First, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Uh, it is not giving me the option to share the screen. Uh, there is a, you can see at the bottom, there is a one present now yeah. beside the hand. Yeah, there. yeah, I'm, I'm uh, clicking on that and uh, it only gives me the option to cancel, not to share. That's oh, disabled. Oh, okay. It's, I don't know why. Uh, maybe uh, somebody can give me the access to present now. Um, I we didn't we didn't like um we give access to anybody no. to yeah to present actually. So when you click present now, uh, what so, is it actually showing? Uh, is it's it show uh, when I it's uh, when I uh, click on present now. It gives your entire screen uh, all the options, a window or a tab. When I click the entire screen one, yeah, it, it says that, do you want to share this uh, screen? And it does not give yes. me the option to share. There is an option, there, but it is gray. Oh, it's, OK. OK, now, maybe. That's, that's now it's, it's working. So can I? Uh, okay. How about now? Can you Can you see my screen? Uh, yep, it's presenting. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes, uh, and yes, I can uh, see it. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I got this idea that it's a little bit slow, so I will try to move slowly. Uh, so uh, about uh, the topic I'm going to present today is advanced fabrication techniques for antennas beyond 5G. I don't want to sound too boring about antennas, electromagnetic stuff, and I will not go into the details of very complex equations and of microwaves or or electromagnetic waves. I will try to make it as light as possible, as casual as possible, and I will try to deliver the point that why we need advanced fabrication techniques for antennas beyond 5G. And uh, on the forum of AP, MTT, EMC webinar series, uh, today I I'm presenting, and uh, as you have seen my introduction, I'm Saida Fizajlani. I'm currently lecturer in radio spectrum physics in the Department of Physics at Aberystwyth University. Here I am a course coordinator of MSc Radio Spectrum Engineering. Just a brief overview of uh, what we are doing here in Aberystwyth. So in, uh, there is a new innovative MSc degree program to produce postgraduate specialists with es essential expertise in the state-of-the-art fields of wireless communication networks, radio frequency engineering, microwave engineering, antenna design and wave propagation, and RF spectrum management. So this MSc encompasses all these state-of-the-art fields in one umbrella. 
Why our program is different from others? We cover all the aspects of the demands of the industry. Before designing this MSc program, we talked to industry people and we asked that what they actually need. For instance, in the conventional engineering degree schemes like telecommunication, wireless networking, radio frequency communication, or microwave engineering, or even a standalone spectrum management degree, they all leave behind a gap. Something is missing always. So in this MSc program, we try to incorporate the knowledge of spectrum management with the no basic knowledge of all these above mentioned fields. So the, tar uh, the target is to develop state and uh, state of the art research and development and who can apply. Obviously, we welcome the graduates from bachelors in physics, astrophysics, mathematics, computer science, as well as bachelors in engineering in the field of electrical, electronics, communication, telecommunication, computer science, aeronautical space engineering, and other related fields. It's a one year uh, MSc degree program, starts in September and ends in August. And also the graduates can access the UK two years graduate working visa uh, after the end of, uh, after the completion of their degree. That's what we are doing here. And now I will move to advanced fabrication techniques for antennas beyond 5G, my actual topic of discussion. So the contents which I am going to cover today is I will start with the basic theory of antenna, just a refresher, and then I will move towards smart antennas and what they are, why we need them. And also then I will talk about advanced manufacturing techniques to develop smart antennas. And the last, in, in the end, I will present some of my own antennas, which I published, and they were developed by these advanced manufacturing techniques, just to give it an example. Starting with the basic theory of antenna, uh, you guys in the audience, you are familiar with the antenna, what antenna does, what it is, it's just a wire or a conductor. It transmits and it receives radio frequencies. So how easy it sounds, it doesn't work exactly in the same way. For instance, it, although it says that it transmits the energy or RF energy or an oscillating signal from the generator through the transmission line to the antenna surface and at the antenna surface, it got converted. That oscillating energy get converted into the form of electromagnetic waves and then transmit in, in the outer space. For instance, in this first animation, you will see that there is a dipole antenna and how the voltages are changing because of the RF input signal or a high frequency oscillating input signal. You will see that as a result of which an alternating electric field is generated and as a result of which an alternating magnetic field is generated and both of them superimpose and form the radiation and that's how a dipole antenna radiates, which you see in this third animation. So that's how we transmit our signal. So if that has, uh, and, uh, a data embedded in it. And at the receiver side, that radiation is captured by the receiving antenna and it takes off the oscillating energy and it takes the data out of it and it is retrieved to the receiver. In the whole process of transmission, antenna impedance matching plays a significant role. For instance, at the generator side, if you try to model the antenna circuitry, you will see that here there is an antenna and here is a, there is an AC source with some internal resistance of it. So if you go back to this first figure here, there is a generator and then there is an antenna. If, for instance, your transmitter li uh, transmission line is not properly designed, then there is a chance that you have a perfectly working antenna, you have a perfectly working generator, but it is not transmitting anything because of the mismatch at the transmission line. So the idea behind that is that you need to design your transmission line in a way that your generator impedance should match with your antenna impedance. So in electrical terms or in circuit terms, your generator impedance and your load impedance, which is your antenna's impedance, should match. And in most of the cases, they are 50 ohms. And so what you need is your ZL should equal to Z0. There are several parameters that characterize this matching. For instance, you can check S11. It is one of the parameters. And um, like from port one to uh, uh, so scattering pattern, uh, 
parameters between port one and one. And you, uh, you can also look for the reflection coefficient. You can also look for several other parameters like voltage standing wave ratio. All these parameters tell you how matched, how good your matching is between the antenna and the input generator. The, the next parameter is radiation pattern. And especially we are interested in far field radiation pattern. Antenna can radiate in different ways. You have an antenna, it could radiate here, 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 anywhere. So what's, uh, but based on the radiation pattern, we have named them. For instance, if we are getting a radiation just perpendicular to the direction of your antenna, for instance, this is your antenna and just perpendicular to that, it's radiating. You will see a bore side, you, you call it as bore side radiation pattern. But what if your antenna is radiating along the line of the antenna? For instance, it's uh, the end of your antenna is on fire. So you can say that the radiation from the end of the antenna are transmitting. So you can say that it's an end fire pattern. Another example is omnidirectional antenna. In omnidirectional antenna, especially your GPS antenna, your Wi-Fi antenna, Wi-Fi router antenna in your home, you see that the antenna is radiating in all the directions because the application suggests that the radiation should go everywhere, right? <clears throat> so it, it, the pattern should look like something, a donut shape, that it is radiating in all the directions. The next one is highly directive pattern. For instance, in your application, you want to establish a line of sight link between a transmitter and a receiver. For instance, a, an example is a satellite communication. In satellite communication, you want a focused beam a beam that transmits from the, for instance, there is an antenna on the ground and then there is an antenna in the outer space on a satellite. So you want to establish a line of sight link in between them. So in that case, what you do is that you want a highly directive beam that, that is being transmitted from your uh, transmitter side. In that case, when you are making a, a highly directive antenna, life is practical it's not real it's not ideal right so you cannot converge all the energy in one direction it's very hard to do that in there are always energy losses in unwanted or undesired directions and they are called as side lobes for instance here there is a main beam a focused beam of radiation pointing towards the receiver side but there are some side lobes and they have some sort of some packets of energy in in them and if, for instance, in an ideal case, all that energy should be converged into one radiation beam and uh, should be transmitted like that. But here in this case, we are not seeing that thing. And that's a practical example of highly directive patterns. But what we could do is reduce the energy dissipation in these side loops. So we set a level that a good antenna should have um, minus 10 dB or reference level that the power of your side lobe should be below minus 10 dB from your main lobe power. Next generation of antennas. Now let's take an example of a line of sight link between a satellite antenna and a, an antenna on the ground. For, for that purpose, we usually use a dish antenna, right? but your satellite will not always remain in the same place. Your satellite will move around. It's just like your moon, right? The moon is not always at the same place when you go out and look at the moon at night, right? It will not always in the same, uh, same place. It's just like uh, uh, any other satellite. So there are geostationary satellites which try to preserve their position, but there are several other satellites that revolve around the Earth and their position changes with time. Every day there is a new position. So what you need is a whole motory system, like in, in initial time of satellite communication, what they did is that there was a whole mechanical system to rotate your uh, uh, satellite dish accordingly every single day to position it exactly with the position of your satellite antenna. But now there, there, it's a time when uh, we have implemented smart antennas. They are generally multi-beam antennas or adaptive antennas. Adaptive antennas means that they can adapt themselves according to the demand. So, and they have the cognitive control. They can decide or they can steer. They can steer their beam in the desired direction. So for instance, in this animation, you will see that the beam is steering 
in different directions. So as a result of which, uh, you don't need this whole mechanism of mechanical movement for moving your whole giant uh, antenna uh, uh, dish antenna. What you need is a, what you need is an adaptive antenna that can easily steer its beam into a particular direction. That's the idea behind that. The smart antenna market is projected to reach about 15 billion by 2031. So in just a few years' time, we will see that it's a huge industry itself. So let's talk about next generation antenna designs. You have seen that these designs, which I have uh, uh, taken a few pictures and included in this uh, slide, you see that they're not conventional. They're not like a wire antenna or a dish antenna or a horn antenna. They, they have different structures. And these structures are, for instance, in the first example, I have placed a metasurface. Metasurface has an excellent property of manipulating EM fields. So the actual EM field, the intrinsic properties of EM fields could be manipulated with the help of metasurfaces. Then there are other types of the antennas, for instance. But the idea is, for instance, in the second antenna, what how antenna radiates, it, it all depends on the length of the wire. On what frequency you want to radiate your antenna depends on the length of the wire. If you want to resonate it on a lower frequency, in that case, what you need is a longer length. But can you fit that longer length of the antenna in a structure like this, in the second figure which you see, in the form of different loops and loops and loops, as a result of which you can fit a long length in a small compact area. So this could reduce the size or weight or aerodynamic drag and cost. So there are multiple advantages of making such changes. Key innovations include <clears throat> composite materials and novel selective metallization processes, which I, I will talk today about what these metallization processes are. So advantages are cost-effective realization of versatile, tunable, robust, lightweight, and programmable antennas. Like whatever we could achieve from an antenna could be done in this next generation of antenna design. <clears throat> Why we were uh, needing the advanced fabrication techniques? Because there were limitations with the conventional fabrication techniques. Conventional fabrication techniques were milling, molding, casting, cutting, sawing, stamping. But uh, one uh, important thing which is important to understand for the people who are, who are not from the antennas background, in order to radiate electromagnetic radiation, you need a metal structure. And the metal structure should be designed in a specific way based on the uh, electromagnetic principles and the antenna theory principles. If, if that shape, that particular shape is not on the mark, is not exactly made on the right uh, measurements, then it will not re resonate on the same frequency. Also, there, there, there could be other issues in that, that if it's a 3D dimensional antenna, you might need some advanced methods to do that. And if you're using conventional methods, there are so many limitations, for instance, high cost, setup time is large, material waste, in, especially in the subtractive methods. For instance, if you take a big block of metal and you want to design a 3D horn antenna, you need to take out or scrape out all the metal from the inside. You need to cut off the metal from the edges to design it in the shape of a horn antenna. The rest of the metal is a wastage. So a lot of metal is being wasted in, in such subtractive techniques. Complex assembly required for complex designs and limited material combinations. There are so many limitations, but in advanced fabrication techniques, we are trying our best to help out the whole process and try to get the most precise uh, accuracy in the design. There are several advanced fabrication techniques. I just picked five of them to discuss today. The one is in inkjet printing, second is flexo printing, then laser milling, photolithography, 3D printing. Starting with inkjet printing, it's just like a normal printer. Uh, maybe in old age uh, printers, maybe you have seen that the old printers from 90s, you, you might have seen that how they printed the paper. 
uh, it was not our current printers that you just place the paper uh, which you want to print and then the pattern comes on it. The old printers print used to do printing line by line. So inkjet printer works exactly in the same way. It prints the pattern line by line. It has a nozzle and a jet. You, you can see in the first figure and the ink comes through the nozzle and this is controlled by a piezoelectric transducer that controls the voltage. So if you increase the voltage, it will drive more, more ink through the nozzle. And, and uh, this could also be uh, controlled. For instance, if you have ink with different viscosities, for instance, if your ink is really thick, you need to increase the applied voltage to push the ink through the nozzle. So there are several uh, uh, parameters you need to see or before working with the uh, inkjet printer. In this figure, I have shown an in-house inkjet printer on which I worked on, and there is a print pattern. And here you see that there are some lines. I hope these lines are visible. So the pattern is printed line by line. And if you see in the schematic in the first uh, figure, you will see that the ink comes in the form of droplets and make a line. And then there is a line by line pattern. Uh, and after that, the next, once you print the pattern, it's not conductive. You need to perform a sintering method. Why you need sintering? Because if you see in this figure A, this small block of figure A, you will see that this shows an ink composition. The ink which we use for printing is a metallic ink. Usually we prefer to use nanoparticle ink because the particle sizes are too small. An example here is silver nanoparticle ink. So it has silver particles which are of nan which are of nanometer size and nanometer size. And those small particles are encapsulated with some sort of polymer sheet, which you see here with the black lines. So polymers are actually protecting those small nanoparticles from getting oxidized because they are in, in dispersed in a liquid. And that's how the ink is formed. So once the printing is done on the pattern, the first thing happens is that because of the air dry method, all the solvent in the ink evaporates. So uh, the, what you leave behind is this B, B figure. All the blue solvent has been evaporated. What you have is encapsulated particles of ink. They are not conductive because of the polymer, uh, polymer sheet around it. You need to apply some sort of sintering method, for instance, heat sintering or uh, ultraviolet exposure that breaks down that polymer sheet. And if, because you are uh, elevating the temperature, as a result of which these nanoparticles will melt down. And as a result of this, they com get combined and you will have a more flattened or, or smooth and uniform surface of the printed pattern. There are multiple ways. Uh, for instance, in, on, over a substrate, there is a microporous coating of a chemical material that once you print it on it, it chemically does all the process and the ink become conductive. It breaks the shade, it evaporates the solvent, everything is done without involving any heating or anything. So this uh, this avoids a, a, a chance of decolorization because of heating or bending of your substrate because most of these substrates are flexible materials, plastic based. The next step is characterization. In the characterization process, you check that how good is the quality of your printed pattern. So what you do is that in this figure, you will see that I this is my own personally designed antenna. I printed it over a, a surface of PET flexible substrate, and it is printed by silver nanoparticle ink. And if you see that how small the antenna is that you can hold it in between your fingers. So it's, and it's flexible, you can bend it, you can... So there are several uh, uh, characterization techniques which we adopt at that point. For instance, in order to look how, how prone this whole thing is towards cracks. So crack analysis is important because flexible antennas are meant to be placed in in a bending position or it could bend over and over and if there is a crack it means that the connection broke 
at that point. So uh, what's important here is to check the conductivity and surface roughness. So there are several other characterization parameters which we analyze at that point, And after that, the antenna is ready to go to be implemented in a system. The next is flexo printing. You guys must be, have seen those videos uh, in which they show that how the newspaper is printed. There are multiple rollers, and in between there is a paper, and the, the pattern goes on the uh, on the uh, on the paper newspaper by this uh, roller printing method. Flexo printing is similar to that. It has three rollers. The first roller gets the ink. And when, whenever it rolls over and over in the, I'm, I'm talking about this first figure, you will see that when, once the first uh, roller moves, the ink gets transferred on the doctor plate. As a result of which, it uh, once it moves and it get in contact with the second uh, roller, the second roller has an engraved pattern which you want to print. So that engraved pattern gets the ink from this doctor plate. It is also called plate cylinder roller. And the third one is impression cylinder. The impression cylinder holds the substrate on which you want to print. Once this impression cylinder gets into contact with this flexo plate or plate cylinder roller, what happens is that because this pattern, this roller has an engraved pattern that gets the ink, just like an ink stamp, stamp pad, so that pattern gets transferred on the substrate. And that's how the pattern is transmitted over the substrate. And the, the more uh, 3D illustration of that is shown in this figure uh, in the second one. You, here you will see a doctor plate. A doctor plate is transferring the ink to the first cylinder. And in the first cylinder, then transmit the ink to the second cylinder. And that second cylinder has an engraved pattern on it. And that pattern, when, once it gets in contact with the substrate, and it transfers the pattern with the ink over the substrate. That's how flexo printing works. The third method is screen printing. In the screen printing method, it's, it's one of the easiest form. Uh, you might have seen the example of printing t-shirts with the screens. So you have a screen made up of net, usually has a wooden frame around it. And on that, the pattern is left behind in the form of a net. And the rest of the things are made opaque by using some sort of paint or something like that. So the screen has some sort of pattern on it. So once you place that screen on top of the substrate and place some ink on top of it, and with the help of squeeze, once you move the ink over the surface, the pattern gets transferred on your substrate. So it's one of the simplest method of printing. And with minimal losses, easy to print and easy to handle. The next, which is a relatively costly method, is photolithography. For instance, if you are thinking of designing an antenna on 60 gigahertz or even above, the antenna size becomes really small. And on that small antenna, it's very hard to fabricate it with the right dimensions by using any of the previously mentioned techniques. With inject printing, you can still get up to 60 gigahertz, but what if you are working on 90 gigahertz frequency? At that frequency, the previous method of screen printing won't work because a screen printing has relatively lesser resolution as compared to other uh, other techniques same is the case with the flexo printing the because it's it's a pattern you can you can design it with the accuracy of 1 millimeter but you cannot design it with the accuracy of 1 micrometer the pattern cannot be as fine and precise in flexo printing in inkjet printing you can go up to uh, for instance a 0.1 millimeter of resolution but not more than that. So there are limitations of each, these, uh, each of these methods, but in photolithography, these limitations have been reduced a lot, but it is a costly process and it needs clean room facilities. And most of the microwave devices, small circuitries, they are made by this process. 
In portal lithography, you have a substrate. You deposit a thin film on top of it, spin coat it after do a soft bake. And then and the next step is making a layer of a photoresist on top of it. After depositing a photoresist, the next step is masking. In that, you what you do is you take a mask. Usually, the mask is made up of glass and which has some bits which are transparent and some bits which are completely opaque. And then you shine a light on it, an ultraviolet exposure on top of that. What happens is that once that ultraviolet exposure goes on this layer of photoresist, it becomes active. A part of it becomes able to dissolve in our developer, and a part of that becomes in, in uh, undissolvable in the a solvent. So the next step is to develop that thing in a solvent. So you place that whole thing in a solvent or a developer where it takes off or etch off the part of the photoresist, as a result of which a pattern is being made on the top of a thin film. The next step is etching. What you do is that you, because this is a metal, metal layer, usually most of the cases in this thin film is a metal layer and the metal is etched off by different uh, etching techniques. You, you can pick any appropriate one. And after that, you will have a photoresist and an etched pattern of metal. The next step is removal of the resist, photoresist, and then that will leave behind your substrate and on top of it is a pattern of metal. So it's a, a mat metallization technique. In this way, you can develop an antenna pattern over a substrate. Next method is 3D printing. In 3D printing, I just illustrated it with the help of an example of a horn antenna. Just see a metal horn antenna, and there is a 3D printed horn antenna. And in your mind, you will be able to evaluate two processes. You take a big chunk of metal, you cut out at these pieces and after that you used expensive methods of aligning them combining them and a lot of hassle to develop this metal based horn antenna now you have that horn antenna it can easily get crowded one thing second thing is it's very heavy so imagine the application where you need lightweight antennas for instance in satellite communication, for instance, and outer space applications, you need your antenna to be as light as possible. So this becomes a liability in that case. So what you do here is, for instance, you can go for the alternative method of making a 3D printed antenna. It's a very simple process. What you need is a 3D printer that takes a fiber-based filament and make a layer-by-layer -layer growth of a printed structure. As a result of which, you will get this structure. And what you need is as a next step, just do the metallization. There are several methods of doing that. For instance, one method is spray coating. You take a metal spray and just coat it over the surface. Or you can do the electroplating or jet metal technology. There are multiple ways of doing that. So a thin layer of metal will be deposited, the surface becomes metallic and the antenna could radiate. So in this one paper, you, uh, there is a comparison made with, with the reference horn antenna and a 3D printed E-plate antenna F -F printed with one method and electroplating. And then there is another 3D printed antenna where jet metal technology was used. And the results were printed. And surprisingly, the results were similar, very close. So instead of using a heavy metal chunk, what you could do is 3D print that structure and perform a proper metallization to cover the surface with a metal, metallic spray. But there are certain limitations of that process too. For instance, if you apply a heavy weight or heavy pressure over the first antenna, which is made up of metal, it will sustain because it's a metal and there is a bonding between the atoms at that level in the metal. But if you apply stain or pressure, 
high pressure over the 3D printed antenna, it has layered structure, the layers will collapse. So it depends on the demand where you want to use that antenna and what are the needs and based on that you can go for a suitable process. Next is laser milling. Uh, you guys must be familiar of prototyping, PCB prototyping. What you do is uh, there is a substrate on top of that is a metal, metal cladding, and you just place it in a PCB uh, a prototyping. PCB is printed circuit boards. So it will print a surface or a pattern on the, on the structure. And that's how all your printed boards, which are used in the computers and everywhere in electronic circuits are made. What if instead of using a metal bit to cut that, you are using a laser nozzle? In that laser nozzle, what you could do is you can go to the accuracy of 0.1 mm or even less. Sometimes in most of the laser milling machines, you can even go to 0.05 mm. It's very small, a very high resolution. So uh, you can see that the how fine this prototyping is being done on this circuit. So laser milling is one of the technique, but what's the drawback or what's the limitation is that you need an expensive laser milling machine and it's usually quite expensive. So uh, that's one of the uh, techniques. Now I will start with a few examples of the antennas which I developed. For instance, enhanced Franklin antenna array. That was uh, the antenna which I made. And in that antenna, you will see that it's a one dimensional array and it is printed by laser milling method. It looks pretty big, but it's quite a small antenna. It's less than one inch of the antenna. And in that antenna, you will see that it has multiple bands at 28 gigahertz, at 36, at 38 gigahertz. And if you see that the whole band is being covered because the, okay, just a reminder that this S11 parameter is your uh, measure of how good the impedance matching is. So if it's level, or if your S11 level is below minus 10 dB, then it shows that the antenna is re resonating. So in the first plot, you will see a frequency range between 26 to 40 gigahertz. And if you see the plot, you will see that in this frequency range, you will see the plot below minus 10 dB reference. So starting from this point, I'm just uh, focusing on the bold line here, the first graph. In the bold line, you will see that it starts from somewhere close to 28 gigahertz, 27 point something uh, gigahertz, and it goes all the way to approximately 39 gigahertz. So that antenna resonates from 27.7 gigahertz to 39 gigahertz all the way because it's this S11, it's very impedance matching is below minus 10 dB in this complete range. The further plots in this uh, one plot are representing its parametric analysis when its specific length was changed as a result of which its impedance matching was changed. Similar is the case with the second one. This, the antenna was also optimized with another parameter. LP is this length, LS is this length. And based on these lengths, once the parametric analysis was done, the easiest uh, thing to look here is the pattern below minus 10 dB. And the area under the curve below minus 10 dB, you will see here you read the frequency that shows that the antenna is resonating below the, uh, in, sorry, the antenna is resonating in the range between 27.7 gigahertz to 39 gigahertz, which is a wide range. And uh, that antenna is fabricated by the this laser milling method. As a result of which these fine cuts, you can see here, these fine cuts, these fine edges were made, which were not possible by implementing the same antenna by any other conventional method. It has pretty high gain that you can see that on different frequencies, it has a gain, uh, gain is a measure of how good the radiation is. So uh, the radiation, if you see the radiation gain is 
above 7 dB in the complete range of between 28 to 38 gigahertz. These are the radiation patterns. So in, initially, I discussed the 3D radiation patterns. If you take two polar cuts of those radiations, you will find the pattern something like this. So that shows that the antenna radiation pattern is fairly omnidirectional. Then the design was further enhanced into a two-dimensional array. Instead of a one-dimensional array, which I discussed in the previous slide here, I designed the antenna in two-dimensional array with different patches and the feeding networks. And the, the size of that antenna is also pretty small. And here, if you see the S11 plot, and this board line will tell you that what's below minus 10 dB, you will see the range between somewhere around 26 gigahertz to all the way 40 gigahertz. And this is called Ka band. So it covers the whole Ka band frequencies between 26 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz because the pattern is below minus 10 dB. And in this range, the gain is pretty high. For instance, in this range between 26 to 28 or 30 gigahertz, the gain is above even 10 dB. And in the rest of the range, again, it goes, for instance, in this frequency of 33 gigahertz, the gain is around 8 dB. So you can use these different frequency bands of millimeter waves and uh, the, the antenna can work on those bands. And it is also fabricated by that laser milling method. The next one is uh, the same design was implemented on a flexible substrate. All those few parameters were changed and optimized according to the substrate uh, dielectric constant. And as a result of which, I got this PET based, a flexible printed antenna. This is the fabricated antenna photo. And here you will see that I used silver nanoparticle ink to pattern that by using inkjet printing. The first method which I discussed, the inkjet printing with a nozzle and uh, the whole sintering method. So this antenna, you, you could see that how good the resolution is. The antenna is really small, but all these slots are made perfectly fine. All these cuts are fine. And if you see the um, measured response shown by this red line, and if you re read this minus 10 dB reference level, you will see that the antenna works perfectly fine from 25 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. So that's the impedance matching. But in the radiation pattern, the antenna shows unique properties. For instance, it can scan its beam on different frequencies. Here, if you see at 24 gigahertz pattern, the antenna is almost bore side, perpendicular to the surface, but it goes on a different angle at this 26 gigahertz of frequency in the figure B. And in the figure C, it goes further down, and in the figure D, further down. So it becomes nearly end fire. So you can see that this whole first quadrant has been covered from bore side to end fire in different stages at different frequencies. So its beam is shifted on different frequencies and it is moved from one to another where you can use it. For instance, if you want to place this antenna on your body, on in a garment or somewhere, it's because it's flexible. So you can use one frequency. It works in the whole range between 25 uh, gigahertz to onwards to uh, 30 gigahertz. Even a part of it is also working on 24 gigahertz because for some communication links, we, we take the reference of minus 6 dB. So what we could do is that if you want to, do, uh, to set uh, this antenna that can transmit and receive so in one direction, it, uh, it can use a beam that can transmit, and in the other direction, it can use a beam that can receive without the interference. So there are several other advantages of these beam steering antennas that you can use multiple beams. And because it's working at one point, it is working with all, it's radiating in all these four directions, but on different frequencies. And it is working on all these frequencies simultaneously. So as a result of which, you can use multi-beams for multiple applications. So the next one is also a flexible antenna, which I designed. 
and I printed uh, it or I made uh, the fabrication by two different methods. It was uh, having a substrate of liquid crystal polymer and the first antenna here was inkjet printed on a liquid crystal polymer LCP uh, substrate and the second one I used the method of laser milling. So I used two different methods and I compared their performance and the, com the performance was quite comparable. So it's quite similar. You could see that everything is below minus 10 dB. That shows that the antenna works fine from 26 gigahertz to 38 gigahertz or even up to 39 gigahertz. But also when I placed it on my skin in this picture, you could see that it is placed on my hand. There is a dotted line pattern that shows that the frequency was slightly shift toward the lower side, and but it can still work up till 30. Uh, sorry, 35 gigahertz. So all the way up to 35 gigahertz, it's still working on my skin. Uh, and these sort of distortions are uh, unavoidable because your skin dielectric becomes a part of your antenna because it, the antenna does not have a ground plane on the back. So it, it, that effect cannot be shielded in such scenarios. Besides that, that antenna is kind of having an omnidirectional radiation pattern still the antenna has a pretty high gain and it is very hard to get a consistent gain over a huge frequency range between 26 to 40 gigahertz. So imagine such a huge range of frequencies and on all those frequencies, the antenna gain is consistent. So you, you could see here that the antenna gain is roughly around 8 dB in all these frequencies. And that's the radiation efficiency dotted and dashed. And that shows that approximately on the range of the frequencies, the radiation efficiency is approximately 90%, which is pretty high. And here uh, I uh, tried to develop a two patch antenna, which is in the form of an array. It, uh, the initial design was a single patch antenna. Then I enhanced the design in order to get more high gain performance. and when you are making the antenna array, the problem is that you cannot conserve your bandwidth. Antenna arrays are having a, a properly defined um, uh, lengths, and these lengths are reciprocal to their wavelength. So they can only be designed on a specific wavelength. In order to design an antenna array, which can cover a huge band of wavelength is quite a critical challenge. So once I made this two element array, I figured out that this red plot, you can see that it's all below minus 10 dB in the same range. That shows that the antenna is working, that two element antenna is working between 26 to 40 gigahertz in the complete range. And if you see the pro profile of the gain plot, you will see here this, this green plot is above nine dB in the complete range and it can go up to uh, 11 dB. So it's, it's in between 9 to 11 dB range, and it's quite consistent and flat. The gain performance is quite flat in, in the array too. So, and that's the efficiency plot on the top, dashed line. So just giving you the examples that these sort of antennas, they are teeny tiny antennas. Fabrications become really critical when you are using the conventional methods. But these advanced techniques have made possible an accurate fabrication of these small antennas with small cuts. And the fabrication is so precise that it always resonates exactly on the same frequency. So the, if you see here that the dotted line shows the simulated results and the uh, bold line shows the measured results, you see that the resonances, resonances are shown by these dips. So they are exactly at, on the mark. We are exactly on the same position. And this is because that it is it is designed exactly on the same dimension. It is fabricated exactly on the same dimension. So there is no discrepancy of um, of the or the mismatch. Usually what happens is that you design something uh, and after that once you are implementing it or, or fabricating it, there might be an error in the length of that fabrication could be a 0.1 millimeter length difference. For instance, if you want to make something with 1.5 mil, uh, millimeter in the fabrication, it could be 1.6 millimeter, but that could create a huge change in millimeter wave antennas.
So 0.1 millimeter difference is huge. But if you are getting an accuracy in that level that your fabrication and your simulation matches exactly, then it, then you can say that the, the fabrication method is reliable enough. So these are some examples with this. I can, I can go for what's next. So what's next is that we are in the constant process of developing new and new ways of getting the fabrication on a level that is cheaper. If we are looking for mass communication, these methods, some of these methods are pretty expensive. And what we are looking for is to bring the technology to a level that it is applicable in all these fields, especially if you are going for communication networks. What we look for is a cheap method of fabrication because it is for the common user. If you are looking for a wristband that can measure your blood pressure and other medical uh, parameters, then you want that wristband to be as cheap as possible to increase the number of users and to improve the health conditions of overall and the well-being of, of the whole community. You don't want it to be of 100 pounds or $100 sink. You want it to be as cheap as possible. In order to do that, we need to find ways of how to reduce the cost of these, these advanced methods to bring it to a level that we can go for mass production. Many of these methods, for instance, inkjet printing, screen printing, flexo printing, they can easily go for real-to-real -real process. And for photolithography is initially expensive, but the cost of making one prototype and cost of making 1,000 prototypes is exactly the same with a very small difference because the whole substrate could be processed in that way simultaneously. So that's how we can go for mass production and reduce the time of each method to, to make it more usable and more, more economical. So that's the take of this talk. I hope you enjoyed this. Please, I'm open to all the questions. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Shida. It's a great sharing. Okay, now it's time for our question. All the participants, feel free to ask questions with Dr. Shida regarding the topic. Uh, can proceed with the questions. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. Shida. This is Azremi uh, from Unimap. Uh, thanks for a very nice presentation. I'm just the, uh, I have one very straightforward question about the, uh, considering all the advanced techniques that you have um, for the antenna fabrication, is there any special consideration for the um, connector? I mean, yeah. those those connectors like SMA and, and those, I mean, for high frequencies, probably they have some special consideration. Okay, thanks. That's only my question, thanks. Yeah, for instance, up to 18 gigahertz, you can use uh, SMA connectors. But above uh, 18 gigahertz, you can go for, for instance, KA connector. KA connector goes up to 40 gigahertz. But KA connectors come with different uh, schematics. Usually, the size of the antenna becomes extremely huge, that it becomes comparable to the size of your anten antenna. So the antenna and connector size are almost the same, as a result of which your connectors start radiating. So that's a drawback, which we see. And the best uh, way of dealing with it is that in your simulation, try to model that connector as it is. But the problem is that you are not using connector when you are embedding that in your cell phone, right? In your cell phone, that big connector is not present. So how your antenna would radiate at that point? So you need to see both the scenarios. OK, thanks. Thanks. I guess Shiroz wants to ask question. Yeah. Shiroz, can you may ask your question? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So that was okay. very interesting webinar. Thank you very much. 
But I, my, my query is just, you know, an expectation or curiosity about the application of your work for IoT enable environment like such as smart highways or intelligent highways or smart cities. How much, you know, this work um, has got an application scenario in these applications? So the straightforward answer is a lot. And an uh, explanation would be that in the smart IoT based environments, what we look for is cognitive approach. What we look for is that in, uh, for instance, if you are having a 5G and beyond system, what you look for is a communication system with very high speed and high mobility. And for instance, if uh, 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 like uh, there was a time when we were using our cellular phone at uh, 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 at certain fre frequencies, we, we won't be able to make a call like 15 years back, 20 years ba back, if we were in a high speed train, right, we won't be able to, but now we are able to. And the idea of uh, the next generation of wireless communication is that we can provide that connectivity on a high speed aeroplane. In that case, uh -huh. what you need is highly directive and adaptive antennas. You need an antenna that can switch on its beam and target its application quite fast. And how fastly it can do that, that will improve the mobility of the system. So your mobility speed will increase. So uh, in order to match that, uh, uh, we are looking for adaptive antennas and high speed it, uh, because they can steer their beam accordingly. Oh, thank you very much. And accordingly, this kind of antenna may be used for object detection also because of that high speed yes. quickly and fastly. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so many other medical applications. For instance, these flexible antennas. I worked on a project which was on uh, flexible antennas for on body, and there is a sensor node in a capsule, and that was being swallowed, and it follows the digestive tract. And along with that, there is a belt of antenna, wearable belt, on the yeah. top of the body, and that was constantly getting the position of that antenna and communicating that through that capsule and the capsule was having a camera in it so as a result of which the whole imaging of the digestive system was made so in medicine in telemedicine in diagnostic purposes and in, in uh, the treatment purposes it has so many applications uh, thank you very much thanks a lot Any more questions from the participant? Any more questions? Feel free to ask. No, Prasida. <laughs> so, so I guess no more questions. So let's take a group photo maybe. So please kindly open your webcam, all the participants. I think most of you are shy. <laughs> there is no camera in my computer, so <laughs> picture enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think this all. Okay, one by one. We are opening the webcam. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait on. okay, another one. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you for, thank you all the